Hey, I'm here at Vivang's studio in Northeast Minneapolis with my friend Eric Vivang. He and his wife Michelle work out of this studio. They're both very experienced spoon carvers and Eric's an excellent instructor. So he was kind enough to take some time today to talk spoon carving and carving techniques with us. So let's get started. All right, so we're working with flex cut knives today. So let's start with the tools. Sure. What types of knives do you like to work with when you're carving spoons? Well, you need two types of knives. You need a carving knife um, uh, and also need a hook knife to carve out the bowl. Um, carving knives come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. This one flex cut cells. It's a short knife. It does have a little bit of a curve to the blade, which is actually quite nice when you're carving spoons. Also, the handle is, is a nice size. They also sell um, some straight knives. Here is an example of a knife with a straight blade. Also works really well for spoons. Again, the, the straight blade, they're a little shorter. Certainly great for detail work, um, but I would recommend the, using the larger ones for the actual hogging out of like a, a okay. lot more material. The other knife you need are a hook knife. Mm -hmm. And these are specialty knives that are designed to carve out the inside of a bowl when you're doing spoon carving. So um, without these, it's tough to get the bowl shaped. They all have their sort of, sort of different techniques of how to use them. But the most important thing about these knives or any knives is that they have to be really sharp. Mm -hmm. Anytime you're working by hand, um, hand work, you really have to have sharp knives. Um, and these flex cut knives do come out of the box really, really sharp, which is quite nice. All right, it's good to hear that these knives come sharp, but obviously they're not gonna stay sharp. The more you use it, it's gonna get dull. So what do you do to keep your tools sharp and working well? Yeah, that is super important. I mean, you know, keeping your tools really sharp really makes the difference between having a fun experience and just having just frustration. Right. And um, there's a couple of things that, that I do. Um, one of the main things I do is use a strop. And um, that is a piece of leather um, with some polishing compound rubbed on it. And the polishing compound usually comes in a little brick like this. Rub it on the leather once in a while. And then um, I would say about every time I carve, um, I, will, I will strop the blade. And what the strop does, what you do is you, you push it away from the sharp edge, keeping it on the bevel. What the strop does is it will polish and straighten the edge and it makes a noticeable difference almost right away. Um, whenever I'm doing any detail work, any finish work, that's especially when I'll do it. Uh, now just because something is razor sharp doesn't always mean that it's going to carve very well. You can't overstrop things um, or, or I should say over time that that nice wedge-shaped cutting edge you have can get rounded over um, when you're using the strop. Even though it's razor sharp, it may not carve very well. And that's when I usually go back to the stones okay. to reconstitute that nice sharp wedge. Um, but if you can strop, you won't have to sharpen uh, using the sharpening stones maybe only once a month, maybe even you know, less often than that. Um, but it takes practice. And I would recommend that you, you practice with stropping first. The motion of stropping and sharpening with the stones is the same. So if you can strop, then you can sharpen. Could you go through kind of the main carving techniques that you use when spoon carving? Sure, yeah, the techniques that we use are sort of traditional ways to hold small things while you're carving them, and which spoons are a subset of that. Um, I, didn't, I didn't make these techniques up. These are sort of traditional ways to do it. Most of them are fairly ergonomic and they're safe uh, to do if you're doing them properly. Right. But like anything else, um, you, it takes a little practice and some of them are not very intuitive. But um, I can certainly go through maybe half a dozen of the main ones and talk about where you might use them and all uh, the safety aspects of what, what you need to do. Okay, the first grip I'm going to do is what I call the whittling grip. And that's what you do when you're on the front porch with a stick and a knife. Hold your knife in your fist. I'm right-handed so that um, I'm holding it in my right hand, my knife hand, and my thumbs on the left side of that blade. Um, and you'll notice I'm holding it quite close to the blade. And that's where the power is. If you hold the, the knife down here, you're forming a lever. You gotta fight that. 
if you hold the knife close to the where the blade comes out, it's a smaller lever, lever, you get more power. So for the whittling grip, I'm right-handed, I'm gonna turn to my left, I'm gonna place my piece over my right thigh, and I'm gonna push the knife through the wood. I'm gonna aim down and away from myself. And the reason I wanna aim away from myself is that the knife will tend to drop off the wood and go down. So you want a little bit away from your body. This is a great way to remove a lot of material using the big muscles of your arm and back and uh, quite safe. You're cutting away from yourself. So pretty useful to know how to do for removing a lot of material. The next grip, grip I'm going to show is um, the thumb push, thumb pivot grip. And um, this one requires you to hold the knife in a palm up fashion. Hold your knife hand in front of you put the knife diagonally across your palm, and that blade should be pointed right at your thumb, the sharp edge. You're gonna close your fist over the knife with your thumb on the side of the knife so that your thumbnail and the blade are in the same plane. You can look right down your thumbnail right on that blade. To do the thumb push, thumb pivot, what you'll do is bring your thumbs together on your knee, forming a little teepee with your knuckles. The thumbs together form a pivoting point where you can either push with your left thumb if you're right-handed, your non-knife hand, or you can use your thumbs as a pivoting point. Thumb push, thumb pivot. The push gives you a lot of control but not a lot of power. The pivot engages your knife hand giving you more power and also really good control. This is for short strokes, detail cuts, useful for a lot of parts of the spoon handle, the bowl. Um, it is, however, fatiguing on your hands to a certain extent, especially your non-knife hand where you're using that to provide the power. So the power comes from your non-knife hand, my left hand, and the control comes from your knife hand, in this case, my right hand. The next grip uh, I'm going to do is called the chest lever. This uses a different set of muscles, larger muscle groups, which is an important part of carving. You want to mix things up using your hands too much is going to fatigue them and make them sore. So this grip uses the same palm up grip on the knife. You know, I'll demonstrate that one more time. Place the knife diagonally across your palm with the blade pointed at your thumb. And as you close your fist over the knife, plant that thumb on the side. That thumbnail should be in the same plane as the blade. Instead of going to my knee this time, I'm going to go to my torso and hold my forearms against my torso. The motion is where you Squeeze your shoulder blades together, opening up your chest and forcing the knife through the wood. Since this grip uses the larger muscles of your back and shoulder, you can get a lot of power. It's important though to keep your forearms in contact with your torso. Keep the blade close to your body. Not only do you have more power and control, but you have a lot more safety. So you can, uh, there's variations on this grip. You can, for example, lock the knife against your torso, and pull your piece through. You can lock your piece, pull the knife through, or a combination of both. This is a great grip for removing a lot of material in a hurry. The next grip, I'll pantomime this. Hold the knife in your fist with the blade pointed towards yourself. Since I'm right-handed, I'm going to shift my thumb to the left, to the right side of the blade. And you'll watch as I slide my forearm along my torso, the blade can't actually get close to my body. It's important here to keep the blade vertical in both directions. Tipping the blade towards yourself would be hazardous. So if you put your piece into the mix, clamp your piece with your index finger of your non-knife hand, my left hand, and brace it with the heel of that hand. Put the blade into position and draw it towards yourself. You can see you can pull the blade safely towards yourself. Your wrist will bottom out on your torso, preventing it from getting close to you. Advantage of this cut is that you can look straight down on your blade and see exactly what you're doing. You can also use quite a bit of power. Unfortunately, you're using your body as a clamp. It can be kind of painful on your chest. But it's a great grip for a lot of parts of the spoon. It doesn't work very well for the ends because you can't get too close to your finger you can't get too close to your torso, but for the middle part, it's really excellent. 
There's a variation on this grip that I use quite often. Rather than using my index finger to clamp, I'll pinch the end with my thumb and index finger and use the three extra fingers I have in my non-knife hand to wrap around my knife fist, giving me a ton of power and a ton of control. Notice that my elbows and torso are tucked into my torso. My forearms are close. My wrists are almost touching, giving me a ton of control and power. So you can draw the knife safely towards yourself. So the last grip I'm gonna show you is called the thumb bypass. And what you do is you hold the knife in your fingers like this. Um, and the motion is a squeezing motion where you're squeezing your hand together. My, notice my index finger is wrapped around the back of the blade. And that's sort of give me the, as much power as I can. This grip is purely dependent upon hand strength. You'll notice as I squeeze it, my thumb bypasses the blade. That's why it's called the thumb bypass. Putting your thumb in front of the blade might give you more power, but it's very dangerous. The way this works with your piece is I'll usually hold it on my knee, place my thumb of my knife hand on the piece, aim that blade along an edge of the piece and squeeze. It allows you to cut the ends of things, which is really useful for the end of the handle or for the bowl of the spoon as well. By shifting the position of your thumb and by shifting your piece, you can carve the bowl of the spoon. To use a hook knife, we're going to use the same thumb bypass grip I described earlier. Again, gripping it in my fingers with that index finger wrapped around the back of the blade. The squeezing motion and the rocking motion is what we're going to use to cut the, the uh, bowl of the spoon. The key with the hook knife is to have moderate pressure down. You need to have a uh, downward pressure in order to control the blade. And for that, you need good support for your spoon. I always do it on my knee. The other trick with the hook knife is that you don't want your thumb to be too close to where the blade comes away from the spoon blank. So you have to tip the spoon blank away from you slightly, hide your thumb. Even so, it's very close. You've got about a quarter of an inch or an eighth of an inch between the blade and your thumb. As you press down with the blade on the spoon blank, slide it across the wood and ever so gradually tip the blade into the wood. It's a very shallow cutting angle. Too steep of an angle will cause the knife to chip and skip across the wood. You'll notice as I cut, the blade is just going past my thumb. Again, you lose a little bit of power doing that, but in order to keep your thumb safe, you need to do that. You also notice that as I'm cutting, I, the deeper I go, the wider I go, starting in the center, working my way out. It's easier to do the far side of the spoon bowl out here. Getting closer to my thumb, it's a little more dangerous. So what you can do is you can spin your spoon blank 180 degrees. Start with a palm up grip, spin it across your knee 180 degrees, end up with a palm down grip. You can reach over the top of your non-knife hand to carve the other side of the spoon. The other way to make this safer is to, when you're carving, is to not try to sweep all the way across the spoon. In other words, I'll stop right here. Rather than trying to cut all the way across, putting my thumb in danger. I'll stop right here. And then to do this part, I'll spin my spoon back and do the same thing. I really want to thank Eric for taking the time to share his expertise with us. It was a really fun morning for me. And I don't know about you, but it's kind of hypnotic watching him make those carving cuts, especially when he's dishing out the bowl with a hook knife. And as I'm sure you noticed, spoon carving doesn't require much for materials. You can do it just about anywhere. You really don't need much space. And you can get started with just a couple knives. So if you're looking for a new hobby or a new woodworking skill to develop, I recommend you give spoon carving a try. I'm Dan Carey with Rockler and Woodworkers Journal. Thanks for watching.